us. All right. <laughs> Today's class is Uli Nishmat, Yosef's grandmother. Yos, uh, Miriam Bat Kopel. Miriam Bat Kopel. Tzela Chaim. Neshama should be in Gan Eden. Should be a good proceeding. On behalf of all her descendants and her families, Besoch Klai Yisrael. Chaim, Chaim, and Racha. Amen. A friend of mine, Rabbi Slavatitsky, is a rabbi's emissary in uh, in Belgium. He said there was an opera singer who was uh, made quite an impression on one of the uh, ladies in the audience. And after the uh, after the concert, she walked over to her and she said, "You know, I really was touched by your uh, by your singing. I want to do something for you. You really really you know inspired me. What could I do for you?" So the lady says, you know, I haven't spent a real Shabbat in a, like I used to do with my, with my grandmother. My grandmother used to make Shabbat. I haven't had a Shabbat like I used to have with my grandmother. If you could arrange somehow I could spend Shabbat with my grand, with someone in the way I used to spend, you know, when I was a child, that would be incredible. So she, so her friend calls up Rabbi Savatitsky, Rabbi Savatitsky invites her, and she comes to her house, and at her home, they tell her everything about Shabbat. You know, the Shalom Aleichem, they bring the angels, they shut Chayel, and they tilt Yadayim. They go through the whole... When they get to the tilt Yadayim, they, she doesn't remember anything. Nothing. Kiddush doesn't remember. One thing she says, oh, oh, after she, she washes her hands, they say, now it's time to say a bracha. Oh, bracha? I, that I know. Baruch atah Hashem, blessed are you Hashem, ladik ner Chanukah. The only bracha that she knew was the bracha for lighting the menorah. That was the only thing that her family celebrated, and that's the only thing that, that she knew about. And there's something unique about the celebration of Hanukkah, unlike all other holidays, even people don't go to a Beit Knesset, to go, don't go to synagogue in Yom Kippur, somehow Hanukkah reaches everyone. The question is, what is it about Hanukkah that reaches everyone? And how can we find that pure jar of oil, a pure cruise of oil, that... Hashem gives us on this holiday. It's especially pertinent now. I know some of you are thinking, well, Hanukkah is almost over. It's the opposite. Tonight is called Zot Hanukkah. Zot Hanukkah means this is Hanukkah. The full energy and the full light of Hanukkah begins now after Mincha. As we're approaching now, the main full light of Hanukkah. So the question is, how do we connect to this light of Hanukkah? And it's always around Parashat Miketz. That this Torah portion, Miketz, that we, read, that we uh, celebrate Hanukkah. Every Torah portion, at the end of the Torah portion, there is a number of the verses of the Torah portion and a explanation, a, a one word explanation. No one's really, uh, no one really knows who wrote it. Some great tzaddik, meant it long ago, wrote for every Torah portion the amount of verses of each Torah portion and a name and a number of what, what this means. It didn't explain it too much, and that's a study in itself. There's only one Torah portion in the whole Torah where it says the amount of letters in the Torah portion. It says the amount of verses, amount of sukim. The only one that says the amount of letters is Parashat Miket, this week's Torah portion. How many letters are there in this week's Torah portion? 2,025. Why 2,025? So they say that the Vilna Goyen explained that because this falls out always in time of, time of Hanukkah, 2,025 is the number of Hanukkah. Why? Because on Hanukkah we light eight candles. In Hebrew, the word candle is ner. Ner is equal to 250. Resh is 200. Nun is 50. So if eight candles is how much? It's 2,000. And you have, you're already, you're already doing business already. You're already thinking about it. One second. Set two, two, five, five, seven, <laughs> downtown town in the China. 2,000. And then it starts on 25, day 25 of Kislev. So you have 2,025. That's the whole celebration of Hanukkah. That's why it's in Parshat Miketz. Something even more incredible. You know, this parasha, we read about how Yosef invites his brothers for a meal. They don't know it's Yosef. They think he is just the second in command of the paro, the pharaoh. They don't know this is their brother. And they have a meal together. The, the word the Torah uses for the preparation of the meal, the Yosef says to his, to his uh, servants to prepare the meal, he uses the words, tavoach, tavach, vachen. The word vachen with the letter chet equals Chanukah. He's told them, come to celebrate Hanukkah. Why Hanukkah? I mean, it's a little bit before the story of Hanukkah. But he, he wanted them to come to him. Like, we're now, we're celebrating Hanukkah with Yosef HaTzadik over here. He, he wanted them to celebrate Hanukkah to answer a question that they, that they had. Also, the word Tevoach Tevach is numerically equivalent to 44. 
What does 44 have to do with Hanukkah? We, we light on Hanukkah, including the Shamash, including the candle lights, the other candles, we have 44 total. candles lit in, lit that we light in total in Hanukkah. But why do you want them to celebrate Hanukkah? No, I just, I know the formula for that. Go ahead. Oh, okay. It's the first night, and it's like, it goes for every geometric, uh, uh, you know, formula. It's the first night plus the last night divided by two multiplied by the number of nights. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, and anyway, six, two plus nine, which is 11, times eight, which is 88, divided by two. It works on every number. Cool. Very nice. So, <laughs> so Yosef HaTzadik invites his brothers specifically to celebrate a Hanukkah meal because the Hanukkah will answer a question. The question they, all, they had is like this. It says the Torah says that when Yosef saw his brothers, they did not recognize him. Why did they recognize him? So some say because Yosef, when he left, his family did not have a beard. And when they already had, his brothers were already older, they had beards, but Yosef did not have a beard. And when he came after many years, he now has a beard and, they, and they, uh, he recognized them, but they didn't, but they didn't recognize him. But this doesn't really satisfy us because not all his brothers were so much older than him. Yisachar and Zulun were only a few years older than him. They were born around the same time. Also, even I, I saw it this week, I saw a video of a friend of mine um, who he's now in his late 30s and he was in the video, he's seven years old and I recognized him right away. And I, I texted him, this is you, right? He's like, yes, this is me. I knew right away. Because he has a certain, you know, he tells. Not everyone, you can tell everybody, not everyone can tell everyone, but you can someone, some, some, sometimes tell. This lady was watching on YouTube, she saw a video of someone who looked so similar to her, she had to find out who it was. She discovered, she didn't know, she had a twin sister. Wow. This was her twin sister. So certainly Yosef at Sadik, how come his brothers didn't recognize him? His brothers were such great Sadikims, they were so, they were, they'd given such divine inspiration, how come they couldn't tell who, they, who their brother was? The, the Torah even says that Yosef gathers his brothers together and he said to them, Yosef, your brother came to me. He's like, you know, like goading them on. Your brother came to me and he told me how his brother sold him as a slave and he's right here now with us. Like, look, they look around the room and Yosef's like, yeah, he's right here with us. Look, they, they, they didn't even look. And when he finally told them that I am Yosef, it says, Parchanesh Matan, their souls left their bodies. It was, they, they had to, they, they couldn't handle it. This was the most dramatic moment in the Torah. So what, was, what does it mean they didn't recognize him? Some say that Yosef spoke to them always with a translator. He did pretend that he didn't speak Hebrew. He spoke to them with a translator. And that's why he heard them. He was able to figure out who they were because they were talking to each other. And he knew when they said, Oh, Yisachar, can you, can you come here for a second? Oh, that's Yisachar. There is Zvulun. So he heard them talk to each other so he knew where everyone was. But he himself spoke. He whispered. And he pretended not to know Hebrew. So that's why they couldn't hear his voice. It still doesn't answer the question. <laughs> really, really, the answer is like this. Yosef was totally immersed in the culture of Egypt. He was responsible for the finances, not just of Egypt, of the entire world. He was the one who supported China, United States, together in the time of famine. He was the one who was, who was sending food all over the world, and he was totally immersed in this culture. So the, the, his brothers, they weren't used to this kind of thing for a Jew. What did his brothers do? His brothers were, anybody know? What do you ask his brothers do? Shepherds. They were shepherds. What do Jews do? Jews are shepherds. What do shepherds do? They're, shep they're, they're out in the middle of the field with God. They talk to God. They spread the study Torah. They stay to Hillam. But this can't be our brother. This can't be a Jew. It wasn't just because he was a slave. It wasn't just because he didn't speak their language. It wasn't just... Was because this cannot be. They knew their brother was a tzaddik. They knew he was something special, despite the fact that they hated him. It's a different story in itself. But they couldn't imagine that this could be their brother. Especially if you know the story from Yosef's vantage point. Yosef knows that despite the, the fact that his brothers hated him, and his brothers threw him in a pit, and his brothers sold him into slavery, and he was accused of a crime that he did not commit. Anybody in his shoes would be the most depressed, angry, angry, cruel person. And instead, he is still Yosef HaTzadik. So how could he be this way? What is it that in him that allows him to be this way? To answer that question, he tells him, we have to, have to tell you the story of Hanukkah. The story of Hanukkah is the answer to this, this question. And that's why he invited him to the Sudat Hanukkah, because Hanukkah is the answer.
How is Hanukkah the answer? The Greeks, it seems, were very against our tradition. That's why they fought a war against us. They didn't want us to keep all the different rules. But if you think about it, they weren't so against us. The Greeks, it says in the Torah, they took all the bottles, the jars of oil, and they made them tame. They made them impure, except for uh, Sas's uh, great-great-grandfather's uh, seal was on one bottle. Let's be a little bit There was one, one bottle left. But all the other ones, they just touched them. They made them impure. One second. If they don't want to light the menorah, they're able to break the menorah. They're able to burn down the temple. They're able to break all the bottles. Why did the Torah say that they made them tame? They made them impure. Why did they make them? Why did they want to defile them? Why not just why not just break them? The answer is the Greeks were not against us keeping our traditions. They liked tradition. They liked culture. They were very cult, They were very into culture. You have tradition. You have we have tradition. You have ideas. We have ideas. Let's share it all together. There's nothing unique about what you have. Maybe you have something it's, that we can learn from. But we're all in the same boat. We're all both interested in learning and sharing and discovering and beauty. That's what the Greeks felt. There's a guy who wrote a book about how you could see that science corresponds to Torah. For example, he wrote in the book how our biological clock, every human's biological clock is made up of seven parts. And if a human being doesn't rest every seven days, charabe. He cannot, he cannot, it ruins his, his, uh, his stamina. You need to have once every seven days to rest. He, he, he wrote this in, in this book, and he said, you see this is what Shabbat is. He also wrote about an interesting thing. He, he, the body produces the, um, I forgot what it's called. Um, in order to, to um, a person, if you scab your knee, if you, if, you, if you scrape your knee, so the body produces something to create a, a scab to protect your body from, from a wound. We have this, um, this, this ingredient, for lack of a better word, in our body to a certain percentage every day of our life. There's one day in, our, in the human being's life that has it more than any other day of their life. What day is that? Day eight. Hey. The eighth day of your life. The eighth day of your life, you have more. That Why? Because the eighth day is the day of circumcision. So he writes there about how you see how science corresponds to Torah. It, the ground, the earth, when you, it needs to rest every seven years for it to produce fruit, for it to produce vegetables. You have to leave it fallow. You can't work the land once every seven years. Otherwise, you're ruining the power of the soil. And so he wrote to the Rebbe. Many other, a thick book. And the Rebbe said, there's one point you're missing from your book. It's not because the body produces this ingredient that God told us to circumcise on the eighth day. Thank you, hemoglobin. Yeah, thank you very much. That's hemoglobin that's another. That's a nice four syllable word that none of us would know if you're right or not. So, <laughs> anyway, so the it's the opposite. The Torah is a blueprint for the world. It's not that God knew that the body produces this this ingredient on the eighth day, therefore gave us circumcision. It's the opposite. God told us His laws. God told us a mitzvah. What is a mitzvah? A mitzvah isn't something that's just good for us in this world. A mitzvah is a connection with God. A mitzvah is a, to bond yourself, to connect yourself to God. It's not about what you'll get from it, not about what you'll gain from it. It's the opposite. Because Hashem gave us a mitzvah of circumcision, that causes the world to fit the Torah. It's not that the Torah fits the world. The world was built according to Torah. I'll give you an example. Let's say tomorrow, um, Avi is asked by his dad, Avi, Avi, I want you to go set up the table for Shabbat. Make a salad. So Avi is a very, very respectful son, and right away he runs. Not just he walk. He runs to make that salad. Now, why ask Avi? Avi, why did you make the salad? So what will Avi say? Avi said, I made the salad because because it's for Shabbat. Now, after he makes the salad, his dad says, Avi, by the way, I want you to take your hand and knock on the door ten times. So I was, um, Dad, are you, are you sure? And he says, Yeah, knock on the on the on the on the, on the door ten times. Not 11, not 9, just go 10 times. Uh, okay, that. And he knocks on the door 10 times. Why is he knocking on the door? Just If you unpack that, what is that? It's all there is is dad. Nothing else but dad. It's only because his father told him. Nothing else in that action other than his father. And also, a, a father feels his child, when he do, the child does something for the sake of his father. If, it, if it, When he sets the table for Shabbat, it's not so much for his father as much as it is for Shabbat, as much as it is for what has to get done. This is what the Torah tells us about the story of, of the Greeks. 
The Greeks were all interested in keeping the Torah, keep the laws, keep the, but take out the purity of it. Take out this super rational thing that you're saying exists in the Torah. To remove that stuff. That's not, that's not part of the equation. Just focus on the logic of it. Focus on the beauty of it. But take out that, that, that holiness from it. Take out the divinity of it. Take out the godliness from it. But the Maccabean fought a war against that. Why? Why they fight a war? Because they realized this is the essence of Torah. That's why the name of the family of the Maccabees, what was the name of their family? Chashmonai. What's Chashmonai mean? Chashmona. The ones who feel the number eight. Lachush at Chashmona. That number eight, seven is associated with the days of the week, associated with the normal cycle of nature. Eight represents that which is beyond logic, that which is beyond nature. And the Maccabees, they felt in Torah, they felt that there's something in the Torah that is eight, that is beyond our logic, beyond our feeling, beyond our understanding. It's about our connection with God. I'm going to tell you a story. I'll tell you two, two stories. Unless, uh, two stories okay? Okay, thank you. You can make it three. All right. I know you have them rolled up, Rabbi. <laughs> Unbelievable story. There is this guy who is involved in archaeological um, digging in Israel. And he lives near a Mormon church. So he... Um, in Israel? Yeah. Well, well, go figure, right? <laughs> <laughs> Jews. So... from Utah? <laughs> unfortunately, unfortunately, he got very attached to the Mormons. <laughs> and he became a, a missionary for the Mormons. <laughs> it's not a good idea. <laughs> he became, became a missionary. And he, ha- and he, he tells... The rabbi who's part of this archaeological team says, Today I found my jar of oil. I found my pure pachach I found my pure, pure cruise of oil. He says, What do you mean you found your pure joy of oil? He says, Listen, today on the way to work, I saw my neighbor. My neighbor's a Holocaust survivor. He hates Torah, he hates mitzvot, he hates Judaism. It makes him angry when he sees people you know, dressed as religious people. It bothers him. And I saw outside his window, he has a menorah. And I couldn't believe it. So I stopped and I went to him and I knocked on the door and I said, what in the world is this thing doing in your house? So the guy says, listen, I was, I was walking past this, this Chabad public menorah lighting and, and I was so impressed because I was thinking about how we used to be so persecuted. I was a child and I had a menorah and I was a child and I remembered how we were so persecuted and we had to hide everything and now we're able to be in Israel in public and keep the Torah and, it's, and, with, and, and, and we have the police protecting us and we have the army. So I decided to go over to the rabbi to thank the rabbi for making this really public display of Go'on Yaakov, Jewish pride. The rabbi says, that's very nice. So appreciative that you thanked me. Here is a menorah for you. It's like a menorah for you. The guy's like, no, 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 rabbi, I'm way too old for this stuff. Way too old for this stuff. I'll tell you what we're going to do. Actually, you know what, rabbi? I have a grandson. Doesn't even know that he's Jewish. Doesn't even know anything. I'm going to give it to my grandson. He invites his, so he tells this, 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 this guy who is part of the archaeological team he said, I gave it to my grandson. I told him he's Jewish and he told him what Judaism is about, what Hanukkah is about. And, I told him, and, he, and he lit the menorah and he put it in the window. It was his idea. So this, he says, this guy, he said, I felt totally impure. I felt completely not Jewish. When I saw this menorah in the window, I, some, I felt someone this lit something in me. I felt this, this is who I am. This is the Mormon? This is the Jewish, Jew, the, 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 the yeah. <laughs> Similar story. Rabbi um, Hennig is a Chabad rabbi in China. He made a public menorah lighting in China. He invited all of his friends over there. And there's one, there's one girl who uh, he invited to come. She calls him right before the event. She says, I'm sorry, Rabbi, I know you invited me. I was going to come. I can't come. Why can't I come? I can't come because the monk told me I shouldn't come. <laughs> She's very close to a monk. And the monk said not to come. So he said, can, you, can I give you a menorah? Come, you know, before you go to wherever you're going, you're going to a monastery, whatever it is, can, can, you, can I give you a menorah to light there? To light so, there. So she says, okay. She stops by his house, he gives her a menorah. He gets a call, or Behenna gets a call from the monk. Mm. She lit the menorah there. The monk, was, his mother was Jewish. Wow. And she lit the menorah there. It just, it just let all of his past, you know, it touched something. He's, he called by hand, he asked me, can you please teach me the Torah? I realize there's something missing over here. There's something missing over here. Is that a true story? This is a true story. No. 
story. Listen, Eitan, not only is it the true story, <laughs> this is the story of Yosef HaTzadik, and this is the story of Eitan Shvaigi. This is our story. This is what Yosef brought his brothers together. He wanted to tell them, you know why I'm able to be Yosef HaTzadik, even though I'm involved in all these things around? You, you know why, before you go and tell you or something, do you know why Hasidim, they prefer <laughs> vodka over Coca-Cola? Why? <laughs> you know why? Huh. It all goes back to this conversation that vodka had with Coca-Cola while they were sitting once in a freezer. Coca-Cola and vodka are sitting in the freezer. Coca-Cola sees that vodka is, is doing great, oh, and yeah. vodka sees Coca-Cola is frozen. <laughs> Coca-Cola says, so vodka says to Coca-Cola, um, why, are you, why are you frozen? He says, because it's cold outside. Why aren't you frozen? So vodka tells Coca-Cola, because I don't care what's going on outside. Ah, this, right. is, this is the Pacha This right. is we, we have something deep within us, and Hanukkah allows us to bring out this deep connection to Hashem, no matter what's going on in the world. As a Maccabim, they fought a war against the Egyptians. Imagine taking a rubber band and throwing the rubber band at an elephant. It doesn't make any sense. But why did they do that? They did that because they were Hashmonaim. They felt the miraculous connection to Hashem while they doing whatever they're doing. Similar to you, Giora. You're going on. You have all these big elephants to take care of. You have big problems, big issues. Everyone has. But you know why you're doing it? Because you feel your chashmonai, you feel the eighth, you feel that there is Hashem is with you, whatever is going on, and that is, and that this, this is, this is where we're heading. We're heading towards Biyat Mashiach, Amen. Coming Amen. Mashiach is associated Amen. Amen. with, as you said before, Eitan, Nerech Chanukah, which will never extinguish all other, Amen. the all other uh, uh, karbanot. It says that the sacrifice in the Beit Hamikdash stop, but the menorah always, like always, continues till Biyat Mashiach. We should see it. Take off from Yad Mamish. L'chaim, 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 l'chaim